Hello, my witches, and welcome back to another episode of Spinning the Wheel Podcast with me, your expansive host, Megan Angus. I know it's been a while, you know. <laughs> I don't think I have to tell you about the things that are happening outside. Yeah. <laughs> it's still happening. Okay. We're not going to get into a whole lot of preamble. We're just going to jump directly into the stuff. Uh, things are coming up. Um, subscribe to my newsletter through my website. Send me an email. Join my Patreon. Uh, if you want to keep abreast of all of the things that uh, will be happening at some point. <laughs> Massive, tremendous, ridiculous thank yous to all of my patrons, past and present. Uh, <clears throat> folks who have worked with me, folks who are working with me, folks who have yet to work with me in the future. Thank you, thank you so much um, for supporting me as I do this work. If uh, you are moved or informed or illumined by uh, this work, please uh, leave a rating wherever you find it. Uh, leave a review. Those are always very powerful in the world of pixels and algorithms. Um, or you can join my Patreon for as little as a dollar a month uh, to put a tip in my tip jar. All appreciated, you know, or just think some good thoughts at me. I'll, I'll, I'll take, uh, I'll take just about anything these days. <laughs> okay. We're staying hydrated, of course. Uh, <clears throat> let's get into this. Let's ground into the energy of where we are on the wheel right now, because it has been a minute, right? Okay. So first off, uh, our Asian, uh, Lunar New Year sign, or Asian New Year sign, that is, you know, kind of floating in the background of a lot of what's happening this year is the sign of the dragon. Uh, and dragons, obviously, are very fiery. Um, dragons are intense. Dragons can be greedy and avaristic. They can be very protective and fierce and loyal. Um, dragon energy is dynamic. Uh, it's showy, it's flashy, it's bombastic. Um, so that's kind of like an overview of some of the energy that's floating in the background. Uh, where are we, you know, coming a little closer? We are in spring. And spring energy is centered in awakening after winter. Um, we are stoking our curiosity and we are initiating our, our new version of our new self. Uh, into whatever the action is going to be of the coming solar cycle. Um, we're waking up. We're trying things out. We are naive. We're playful. We're adventurous. We're um, going where we have not gone before. And within the season of spring, we are in Beltane season. We have celebrated the Beltane Sabbath. And in fact, we are a month into Beltane. Uh, we have just left Taurus season and we have moved into the second half of Beltane, Gemini season. Um, so when we think about Beltane, our key elements that we're working with are words like fertility, fecundity, virility, and action. Unions are very important sexuality and sensuality, whatever those words mean for us, they are, it's very important during Beltane season. Um, love, uh, unions, and that can be friendship love, domestic partner love, uh, lusty love, um, you know, all, curious love. It can be all kinds of forms of love and all of the different types of unions uh, that come from having love for ourselves and for other people. Rites of passage are a big deal during Beltane. Um, as well, playing and pranking and being silly is very important during Beltane season. Uh, and divination. And divination. Um, okay. So within Beltane season, as we leave Taurus and we move into Gemini, we pass through the Celtic tree month of Hawthorne. Um, and so the plant Hawthorne, uh, uh, which was pronounced Hoa, uh, Hoa by ancient Celtics, um, 
overseas again, a time of fertility, masculine energy, fire energy. Um, and this is a plant that's often employed in spell crafting when uh, folks are trying to conceive. And so this is really good uh, plant helper, plant ancestor, plant ally for conception of all sorts. Um, it's related to like business success and things like that. Um, and when grown with uh, ash and oak, it attracts the fae. So proceed with caution. Your mileage may vary with that. But this is a plant helper that sort of represents this time of year. Um, and uh, and there's also connection with within Hawthorne to our uh, piece of the wheel that is across from us, uh, Samhain. Um, and uh, there's more on that. I guess I should have said this too. <laughs> <laughs> just jumping right in. Um, but this podcast is also going to have a, um, an extra, extra newslettery piece, uh, for patrons. Um, and, uh, there's more information in there about working with Hawthorne and connecting with, uh, darker forms of the goddess kind of across the wheel. So that's, that's what's up at this time of year. Um, Hawthorne month lasts from May 13th to June 9th. Um, so it kind of stretches between, uh, Taurus and Gemini. And so speaking of which, May 20th, the sun moved into Gemini. And in this second half of Beltane season, we are becoming more aware of the power of, as well as the diversity of our unions. And those are archetypal unions, personal unions, communal unions, material unions. Um, in the first half of Beltane, we are often blending our energies with um, people that hold or represent stuff that is like opposite from us or different from us. We're, we're blending energies through the parts of ourselves that differ. Um, and moving into the last four weeks of Beltane into Gemini season, uh, we explore these unions through the parts of us that share similarities and with people that feel f more familiar. Um, when I think about that twin energy with Gemini, when we're passing through the season of Gemini, we're dealing with all things air, we're dealing with all things mercurial. Um, and so that is mental stuff, the way we think, the way we talk, the way we communicate, uh, what we're thinking and talking about, why we're thinking and talking about that stuff. Um, and really kind of at the root of it is sort of data exchange. That's what's up. Um, and, uh, and Gemini kind of oversees all of that stuff. And so there is this intense, you know, union and connectivity and exchanging going on between people um, where our, our talking and our communication and our thinking about things is, is becomes really, really important. So here we are, last four weeks of Beltane, last four weeks of spring too. Um, and so this full moon that we are about to have, which is the full moon in Sagittarius, right? We didn't even do our normal intro, right? This is Beltane season 2024, full moon in Sagittarius, lunar week question mark, right? Uh, yeah, actually lunar week question mark, because we're just sort of floating in space kids. <laughs> but if I had to guess, it's probably about lunar week, uh, nine, if I had to guess, it's probably about Lunar Week 9. Um, and some of the names for this full moon, I think, are really beautiful and also really telling. Um, so, for one, uh, the, the last full moon of spring is often called a dyad moon. A dyad being... Um, this arboreal tree spirit, basically. Um, and so literally kind of the verdant spirit of earth itself is one of the names for this moon. Uh, but other traditional names for uh, this full moon are the strawberry moon, hot moon, rose moon, mead moon, honey moon, and the moon of horses. Uh, and that's just a few uh, there's more in the, the Beltane workbook. Um, 
uh, which is has been fully revamped and is up on Patreon for download. Uh, so enjoy that. It's pretty fancy looking. Um, so, you know, beautiful stuff here, right? And this can be when we have our full moon in Sagittarius or our full moon in May, right? These That's why we have a list of names and they can change from year to year. So before we get into the details of this particular moon, I'd want to give you some more keywords to work with, right? Here we are. We've kind of narrowed ourselves down to this very specific point on the wheel, uh, which is the full moon in Gemini, excuse me, the, the Gemini full moon, which is Sagittarius. Uh, here in these last four weeks of spring, last four weeks of Beltane, all that stuff. When we're working with a full moon in Sag, we're dealing with words and ideas like the illumination and the culmination of our philosophical world, our wisdom, our expansion, our beliefs, um, our philanthropy or lack thereof. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if any of this like feels like it might be going somewhere for anybody, but you know, <laughs> just kind of keeping world events in the back of our mind, right? Uh, there might be some um, points that we, some dots that we connect here. Okay. So our full moon is uh, going to be at two degrees of Sagittarius, 6.53 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, later in the day for everybody else around the planet, May 23, 2024. Um, and this, the, when the moon is full, it is opposite the sun and we can see the full face. And uh, the metaphor applies. This is the point in our the plant metaphor that we work with, uh, you know, every month with our moon at the full moon, the fruit appears, AKA the results, the culmination, the fulfillment, the, the illumination, right? And so the metaphor of the sun and the moon kind of shining or the, the, we being able to see the full face of the moon reflecting the sun back, um, it shines a full light on our work and our process. And I think that full moons can provide a type of clarity for us and even a type of, a type of holistic understanding. Um, now it's the moon. So we might also be uh, reflecting and deep in our memories or feeling very nostalgic or deep in our feelings and feel and like processing everything through our emotions and not, like witnessing things from a super logical place. But, but I think that we can get a type of holistic understanding during the full moon, or at the very least, we sort of get a sense of like the full spectrum of the situation. And then it's up to us to pay attention or not. So this is our last full moon of spring, um, our last full moon of Beltane. So this full moon does carry a little extra potency as a marker of all of the work that we have done in this stretch of the wheel. And really we can even also think back to the work that we have done over the last six months, especially when it comes to morals and dogma and our philosophies, et cetera, et cetera. This is Sagittarius, right? So this moon is full at two degrees and the ruler of this moon is Jupiter, the ruling planet of Sagittarius and Jupiter has been traveling through Taurus for a year. This last year has brought some kind of intensification or focus individually and collectively to our material resources, wealth and investments and the things we need and the things that we need to believe to feel safe and secure. And I'm going to be harping on the ideas of beliefs and morals and ethics and the way we, the, the paradigm that we kind of frame our world with, because that's a lot of what Sagittarius does. And that's a lot of what Sagittarius concerns itself with. And again, our full moons are places where we're experiencing like a culmination of our work on subject X, right? Okay. So speaking of which, speaking of Jupiter, Jupiter and Venus are both conjunct at 29 degrees and they are opposing this moon. So they're both hanging out with the sun, all lumped up together in Taurus, 
and then the moon is across the sky, or excuse me, all lumped up uh, in just a few degrees. The ends of Taurus, the beginning of G Gemini, and the moon is over across the sky at two degrees of Sag. So um, Venus, of course, rules Taurus. So in a real way, Venus has a lot to say about what's going on with, um, uh, with this full moon. When Venus and Jupiter get together, it can be an all-out bliss fest to the point of overdoing it. Generally speaking, this is a super good day. <laughs> this is a super good vibes day. Uh, great energy, fun to hang out, fun to be social, fun to be awesome, fun to be fun, super great. Uh, it is a really great day for attending to situations and relationships that need an infusion of optimism and growth. So if you've got a situation, if you've got a project that feels like it's lagging, that feels like everybody's kind of down to the dumps, morale is low, people are kind of bumming, this is a really great day to be like, come on team, come on guys, come on self, let's, let's get hyped, let's do it, let's woot, uh, because we have a lot of astro assistance with that. Um, and this full, this, um, blah, 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 these guys are also uh, being aspected by Neptune at 29 degrees Pisces and Pluto retrograde at two degrees Aquarius. Neptune is trining one and sextiling the other, and Pluto is trining the other and sextiling the other. So both trines and sextiles, generally benevolent, generally chill. Um, Pluto and Neptune definitely can add a, an element of surreal or subterranean kind of vibes to the things that we're doing. So stuff may feel a little weird. Um, stuff may feel like a little surreal as we're going along, but where this can maybe go off the rails or like where, where it might go when we start to like get too much of it, um, is that we might feel super ultra mega generous with our resources to the point of overspending to the point of overdoing it unless or until somebody suggests that we have a responsibility to be generous. And then we might respond by clamping down and getting fussy. Um, there's something here about the moon and Venus and Jupiter all hanging out together where everybody wants to be really, really generous and super lovey dovey until it feels like an obligation. We want it to feel spontaneous. Um, and this extends to all of our ships like all of our ships. So our business ships, our friendships, our partnerships, like all of them. Um, and we might be all up in our feels that day or weirdly wishing that we were feeling something intensely as a distraction to the madness or the boredom or the loneliness in our lives and the world. So we might be overdoing it with substance in that search to feel something and wasting resources or engaging in messy unions. So there's a lot of ways that this could go a little sideways, right? <laughs> um, and if we really want to get wild, uh, if we look at this through the lens of world events, Sagittarius rules the ninth house, which is the place of religious institutions and higher education. So I don't know if anybody can think of any events happening on like, I don't know, campuses or like holy sites around the world, maybe where, you know, um, you know, or like institutions of higher education, um, where it feels like things are maybe coming to a crisis point or the full conversation is starting to come into the light, maybe getting very caught up in our feelings and very caught up in our dogma and our fanaticism and all of that stuff. Right. Uh, again, I don't know if this sounds familiar to anybody. So, <laughs> so this full moon is a symbol of, in my opinion, anyways, um, or a reflection of maybe is a better way to say this. This full moon is a reflection of the collective's reckoning around the connections between material resources wealth and investment, dogmatic beliefs, higher education, and how they intersect with our values and how we embody that stuff in community, in real time, 
in the real world. No big deal, witches. NBD. Just that. Just literally... <laughs> just literally that, right? Okay, so a place where we can start to approach this work when it feels difficult, which is super legit, is to ask ourselves questions like this. Where in my beliefs am I holding on to dogma or regressive philosophies that no longer serve the greater good, especially if I feel very like cozy and comfy and safe in those beliefs? That would be a great place to like poke at a little bit. Right. You know, and I'm saying like, if this is right and good for you to do this kind of work, right? If you're, if your therapist is like, please don't do this, don't do this, right? <laughs> I'm saying it. If, if you have, if you're clear for takeoff, like go for it. Okay. Some other, another question that you can ask yourself, am I living in a way that expresses my current philosophical truths and the truths of my community? And spoiler, I bet a lot of us are going to say no to that question or not close, right? Like, like kinda, sometimes, sorta. And so this is a really great moon to take stock in like, how far are we from living our philosophical truth? How far are we from witnessing our community live its ethical truth or its moral truth or its philosophical truth? Um, right. Cause, cause we're, we're all in this together. Um, and we don't want to get swamped in that stuff, but it's important for us to reflect on it and think about like, how far yet do we have to go? Another question, are my wisdom sources, my educational systems, my teachers, or my mentors supporting alignment with those philosophical truths and the greater work of liberation? Do your people talk about that stuff? Do your people call that shit out? Do, the, do your people um, struggle? Do your people, you know, question that? thing do they do the, are they doing the work um you know the, again this is a time period to kind of take an assessment because we've got the full light shining on the full situation right now uh so i recommend those questions if you want to involve those in your full moon uh ritual um i also recommend uh including any kind of a gratitude practice in your full moon observance um as, because Venus is sort of hovering in the background of this whole conversation, um, you know, our values and how we are embodying our values, Beltane season, da 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 like continuously sort of bringing our root back to like what, what truly are my values and how am I expressing them philosophically, right? Like that's really where we're at. Uh, this full moon in Sagittarius is an invitation to consider our results the ramifications of and the reflections around self-righteous, dogmatic, and zealous behaviors and beliefs, where we are trusting blind faith or holding on to delusions for comfort, our excessive, irresponsible, and wasteful behaviors, God bless Sagittarius, it's me, I have so many placements there, please, uh, and the problems that ripple out from all of those beliefs and behaviors. I mean, think about believing in the Western idea, right? And, and as consumers of the Western idea, as consumers of Western culture, the, and the idea of the Western culture, that mindset, think of, think of the ripples that come out from our culture. Think of, think of the things that happen around the planet because we need, you know, for example, cobalt for our, our digital devices. Just as a random example, <laughs> just saying, right? It's, it's, this is, this is the moon for us to think about that stuff. Um, as well, this full moon offers us a chance to witness what happens when we seek and speak truth on behalf of the community. Um, this full moon offers us a chance to witness what happens when um, we, we come into understanding of how much our philosophical understanding of our circumstances has expanded. Think about that over the last six months. Woof, right? And it's been a tough expansion, but we collectively have grown, whether we wanted to or not. Some of us were dragged kicking and screaming, but <laughs> sorry, everybody's got a day one. Everybody has a day one. 
Uh, but but think about the radicalization of of you and the people that you know. And has it happened for everybody? No, but a but a pretty big shift has happened philosophically. I think on planet Earth right now, in some really frightening ways, and some really beautiful ways, necessary ways too. Um, and where we must seed faith, hope, mercy, and see the budding potential in our works. And that is a big part of the Sagittarius full moon too. Throw pennies in wells, make a wish. Uh, you know, Sagittarius energy is very much about like, hey, who knows? Let's give it a shot. It could work. Let's try. By the end of the week, the sun and Venus and Jupiter will all have moved into Gemini, which will emphasize the need to communicate and connect. And all of this action is happening within the auspices of Beltane, the season of union. Who are you coming into alignment with through processing this stuff? How are your unions strengthened by your engagement of this work? What are you seeding and sprouting and cultivating through this work? That's the stuff I want you guys to think about. Um, where are we? All right. Doing pretty good. So dates... For this week, our astro dates, our mytho dates for this week, um, 516, we have the heliacal rising of Algol, which is in the eye or the head of Medusa, which is held by Perseus, goddess bless him, that son of a... Um, you know, I, 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 I talked about this... Um, this star, I mean, I talk about it every year because the sun passes over it every year, but I talked about it specifically a few years ago in reference to the Me Too movement that was happening. And, uh, and Medusa is clearly a like deeply misunderstood archetype. And I think that the uh, family that she ultimately connects back to, the Gorgons. I personally think that the Gorgons connect to Kali and other goddesses like Kali. That is strictly my own bullshit. I have no historical evidence to back that up. It's just my own weird thing. But but I see that and I can't unsee it. And And I think about how much Kali has been demonized over the years. And yet, she's a creator goddess. She's a sustainer goddess. And she's a destroyer goddess. And specifically, she is a destroyer goddess that comes along and destroys stuff when it's time for that thing to be destroyed. She's not getting up off the couch otherwise. <laughs> she's not going to just randomly like decide to have more work to do. She's chilling, eating tons of candy, by the way. Kali really likes candy. So if you want to get on her good side, <laughs> bring sweets. Um, but, but she comes through and ends things when it's time to end them. Anyways, uh, I, I, I think a lot about that kind of stuff when I think about Medusa and specifically, I think about Medusa in, in, in the scope of Perseus's story. And what I said a few years ago, I actually, I still agree with myself, <laughs> which is this. Um, we often think of Medusa with, through the lens, or we see her through the lens of, oh, that old story, you know, that old situation that we all continuously have to deal with as pagans of patriarchy manipulating and warping uh, matriarchy, matrilineal societies and goddesses and turning all goddesses into demons or, or just like obliterating their names and likenesses altogether. And oftentimes that's kind of as far as people go. Like, oh, Medusa probably is a good guy at some point, but then got turned into a bad guy. The end. But where I think about it from is um, from the angle of Perseus. Perseus is just a doofus. Perseus is just an, a, a random average guy 
uh, who somebody points at and is like, you're special. And he's like, surely I am. Of course, obviously I'm a man. I've got to be special. And, you know, and he goes off on his little adventure and he has some fun and he does this and that. And one of the things that he does is he ends up coming across coming across Medusa and, and killing her because she's totally out of control and she's this demon and all this stuff. Society, especially patriarchal society, purposefully uh, is continuously churning out little soldier boys to fight on behalf of, you know, imperialism and all that crap, right? to fight on behalf of patriarchy and that means that they have to have monsters to kill you get me you get where i'm going with this it's not even what happened to medusa you know <laughs> and and how did she get turned or was she always like this but it's Perseus, no, 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 shut up, everybody. Perseus is the main character here, and Perseus needs a monster to kill, to, to, to transform and initiate him into heroism, being a hero, being, being heroic. I, I think about that a lot, and I think about that a lot also with world events uh, and, and how, you know, that like from the movie Shane, he had a gun, you know, like, like, uh, you know, October 7th, right? Let's not think about the 75 years that came before that. Let's just look at this one particular incident that now becomes the excuse to, to chop off the head of Medusa. Uh, maybe that is a wild stretch. Maybe that's a wild stretch. And uh, no, I'll, I'll give that one to you. But that's, that's what I think about, uh, as we pass through this part of the sky, we don't understand, we still don't understand Medusa, um, but we live in a world where people are, are being forced into the roles of heroes to protect something that probably doesn't deserve protecting at all. Um, and, and to emphasize that anything that is against it becomes the monster and, and has to be dealt with accordingly. I'll leave it at that. Okay. Okay. Uh, 520, the sun entered Gemini. 520 also, we have the heliacal rising of Alcyon, which is the brightest star in the Pleiades, uh, which is found in the face of the bull or the Taurus constellation. This is the Seven Sisters, or excuse me, they're, it's located in the, they're located kind of in the shoulder, head, shoulder of the bull. Um, and, uh, the um, image that is often associated with this star is like a lamp um, or a virgin, uh, an untouched, quote-unquote, uh, young lady. Um, this is a star that can assemble spirits, raises winds, and also reveals secret and hidden things. On 523, with our full moon, we also have that crazy Venus, uh, Jupiter, Neptile, Neptune, <laughs> Nept Neptile, yes. There we go. Neptune Pluto situation. So we have Venus conjunct Net Jupiter at 29 degrees of Taurus. Um, and then we have Venus and Jupiter uh, sextile Neptune at 29 degrees of Pisces and trining Pluto retrograde at two degrees of Aquarius. And then later that day, and then they're all in opposition to the full moon. So there's all that. And then a few hours later, Venus enters Gemini, and then another day or two later on the 25th, Jupiter enters Gemini. And uh, Jupiter will be in Gemini for the next year, basically. Um, so we are about to enter a year of Jupiter hanging out in Gemini, which is going to be... Uh, you know, it's uh, you know, <laughs> it's going to be something. It's going to be something. All right, uh, May 26, 526, we have the Heliacal Rising of Hyadem 1 and 2. Uh, these stars are situated in the face of the bull, Taurus. Um, 527, we have the Greek uh, ancient festival, or celebrated by our ancient Greek friends and ancestors, Bendidaya. 
Um, and this was a horse race and a procession for the Thracian or Thracian goddess Bendis. Uh, I cannot find out much information about her. Not really sure what's up with her. Her temple was built very close to uh, the temple of Artemis on the hill Munikia, um, which is just an interesting word. Mun is definitely mountain. Kaya or Kia maybe relates back to Kaibel, maybe not. Might be something entirely different, but we see these word forms in, in uh, other Greek words. Uh, grain was offered to her, but specifically, the one thing that is noted multiple places is that there was a horse race dedicated, dedicated to Bendis, the goddess. And the people at the time were like, so that was very unusual that there was a horse race. Uh, horses are going to come up more and more often as we move through Gemini season. And so here we are very at the very beginning of Gemini season, right? We're just a few days in to Gemini season, and we already are seeing an ancient Greek festiv festival dedicated to horses. Um, one of the full moon names for the Sagittarius full moon is the moon of horses. And, you know, there's more to it than that, kids, but that's all I'm going to mention today. Uh, <laughs> May 29th, we have Mars conjunct Chiron at 22 degrees Aries. Good luck with that. So, you know, after this whole week of like feeling very full, full hearted, maybe we're feeling philanthropic and generous. Maybe we're feeling very philosophically expansive. We're willing to have these convos. We want to connect and feel lovey dovey with our people by the end of the week, uh, or at least by 529 stuff might start to get a little spicy, a little fussy, a little hot. Um, you know, Chiron is about our pain, our, our personal wound. Um, our sacred wound that we carry and Mars is about arguments and, <laughs> and going too fast and cutting yourself with a knife. So, <laughs> so be careful, slow down. Um, but this also might be a day where just, you know, the stuff that hurts you in the world feels especially painful. Um, so slow down, take a breath, drink a little water, um, you know, or, if it's safe and healthy for you, one of the best things to deal with errant Mars energy is sweat. So go do something that makes you sweat and makes your heart pound if that's safe and healthy for you um, as a means to exorcise that, that Marsian, Martian energy. And then also in 529, we have the helical rising of Ain, the, the fixed star Ain. Um, and this marks the northern or the left eye of Taurus the bull. So this is an interesting magical concept for you. The name Ain connects to the levels above the Kabbalistic tree of life. It is two steps down from the Godhead, which we would call Ain Sof Ur. And, which I'm probably mispronouncing, so I apologize all the Kabbalists and Hermeticists who are just like, that's not how you say it. Sorry. It also connects to a magical idea of the left face of God, a.k.a. the part of God or goddess that can be known by us. The hidden side being the part of God or goddess's nature that is unknown. So left side being the part that was known, this star represents the eye of, of on the left side of the face of Taurus. Taurus connecting us to... Um, the Hierophant card, who is certainly a world builder, um, you know, this is our, our, as we talked about, uh, well, we didn't talk about it here on the podcast, sorry, but, uh, in the new moon newsletter that I sent out for patrons, um, you know, it's our, it's our stabilizing force in the material world as we're planting seeds here in spring. Um, so work with that idea however you want to. This is the known side of God or goddess. Um, as I said before, I've got some gratitude rituals, uh, included in the post up for, uh, patrons. I also have some more information about our Celtic tree month of Hawthorne, um, in the newsletter. Uh, and so helpers and altar suggestions for you all, um, as usual, uh, for our lunar body work with a full moon in Sagittarius, we are either activating and adorning or resting, relaxing, and nourishing, whatever your vibes are. Um, 
the lower back, the sciatic nerve, family, and the thighs. As I say in every single podcast, not a doctor of the human corpus. Please check in with your trusted health advisor to make sure that this information is safe for you and your body. Am I so sure? Okay. Um, and then for our plant body work with a full moon and sag, we are planting biennials, perennials, bulbs, roots, trees, grapes, berries, potatoes, shrubs. Or if you're feeling that waning energy, we can be pulling weeds, plowing and cultivating, pruning our vines. So that's all of your pothos plants all over the house. Um, doing pest and disease control, pruning trees, cutting trees for uh, firewood or lumber. Um, and if you have anything that qualifies, uh, harvesting below ground crops for drying and storage. Um, witchy work uh, for our uh, uh, Sagittarius altar um, for the full moon safely include some fire for Sagittarius or include some air oriented stuff like uh, smoke, holy smoke or incense. Uh, for uh, our air Gemini energy. Um, I've got some colors uh, for candles and some incense suggestions in the, in the newsletter. And then our tarot card that we want to work with for this full moon, we actually have a bevy of choices to work with for this uh, full moon. Um, probably the most obvious one would be the lover's card, which connects us to the sign of Gemini. Um, we could also work with that throughout Gemini season, the Gemini new moon, which we're going to have in two weeks or so. Um, but this is really a card of thinking about the, you know, philosophical ramifications of the unions that we're making with people and, and all of that stuff. Right. So the lover's card is sort of the quintessential depiction of union. Um, really straightforward image and just, you know, really appropriate for Beltane season. But, we certainly can hang out with the temperance card, which connects us to Sagittarius and is all about transformations and uniting the disparate parts of the self. So if you're really vibing on that energy of like uniting with other people or other, you know, beings or ideas or groups that are outside of you, the lover's card might be rad to work with. If you're really working on uniting the disparate pieces of yourself, and, and coming into a more whole holistic union internally, the temperance card might be really spicy and fun to work with. And also we can work with the nine of wands, which is uh, the moon in Sagittarius. And um, the moon passes through Sagittarius every single month. So every month we have a chance to work with the moon in Sag slash the nine of wands. So, you know, if you're feeling it, cool. And the nine of wands is a difficult card, but at the root of it, it really is about how we are embodying and expressing our values through the roles that we're trying to play for the people that are around us. And where does that lead us into overwhelm? Where does that lead us into people pleasing? Where does that lead us into um, questioning who we are and the roles that we're playing and why we're doing what we're doing, basically. Um, so any of those I think can be helpful uh, to work with. Um, I am, I think I'm going to call it there for you all. We got in a, a lot of good information. We talked about this full moon a lot and the astrology of this week. We've got some dates for you. There's extra information in the newsletter for patrons. Um, and I know we didn't go off. It's because I, I only talked about the one holy day this week and I kind of skimmed through the astrology of this week. Uh, but, um, you know, to be frank, this is me trying to get back on the bicycle. So be kind, <laughs> be kind with me. Um, and hopefully we will work on some intros and outros at some point. Like I said, uh, my platform changed and all my stuff got deleted. So, uh, we'll see, but thank you for being here with me. Um, and thank you for doing this work, right? This is existential. It's weird. Um, and, uh, and, and it's difficult in some ways. <clears throat> um, and this is another moon where we're really being asked 
again to examine our values and how we are embodying our values in the world, this time through a philosophical lens, an ethical lens, uh, a religion, spiritual practice lens. Um, and I, I, you know, I, call me biased, but I think that this is super vital for our process at this point on earth, you know, like, what are we doing as a species right now? We're kind of losing it. Uh, we, we've, we're definitely lost in the sauce. Um, and the thing that I think could be the most helpful here is hanging out with Jupiter and, uh, really asking Jupiter for some benevolent assistance, like show me the work I need to do sweetly. <laughs> Um, you know, asking Venus for some assistance of like, you know, help me, help me settle comfortably into the work and sit with it and connect with it, um, at, at a heart level. Um, and that I think is some of the more potent stuff that we can do as witches and pagans and magic workers and spirit workers and light workers and shamans and, doulas and you know all of all of us that are out there doing whatever our piece of this is i think one of the most powerful things that we can do is when we connect our philosophical beliefs to our emotional health and our and our emotional intelligence um and sort of check them both with the other you know like uh and and you know, I think, uh, I think that it's easy to sort of get lost in the existential and the philosophical and to forget that there are real humans behind the stuff that we are talking about when we're talking about this stuff. Um, so I hope that this is a beautiful full moon for you. I hope you celebrate or enjoy yourself in whatever way. Um, you know, if you haven't, take it as a moment to reset and refresh your altars or your work tables. Uh, if you haven't in a moment, uh, you know, do a little gratitude uh, list for yourself or a gratitude countdown or any kind of a gratitude practice or a little ritual for yourself. Um, it's very Sagittarius to ritualize uh, our quote unquote normal routines um, and to kind of witness the sacred and the mundane in simple practices like you know, our face washing routine at the end of the night or the routine that we go through to get ready for work in the morning or any of that kind of stuff. So, um, that's also very, very, very potent. Uh, okay. That's it. That's it for real, for real. Uh, thanks for sticking with me and thanks for listening and we'll talk soon. Blessed be my witches. <laughs>